Hey everyone, Jeffrey Capobianco from Breakthrough Performance Coaching. Uh, here to do a webinar tonight with AJ from Moop. We're thrilled to have AJ on the line tonight. Uh, in the moment, I'll turn the controls over to AJ. Uh, but first, a couple of admin things. If you haven't used GoToMeeting before, there is a chat button or a chat window down below. And if you want to go ahead and uh, type your questions in as they come up so that they're fresh in your mind, and we'll either we'll either cover them then if it makes sense. Otherwise, we'll just hold them to the end and um, and compile them and, and answer all of your questions. We'll make sure we get to everything. Uh, but until then, if you just want to go ahead and mute yourselves, just so we don't get any feedback or, or static on the line here. So uh, a little bit of background. I've been using the Whoop Strap now since the the nineteenth of October, uh, and I found it really valuable. Uh, I used it to maximize my final build up and then my taper slash peak into Cozumel. Uh, I was pretty fried heading into this race. Uh, this was going to be my third Ironman of 2016, um, which for me is a is a fairly high load. Um, so I was pretty fried heading into it and just feeling quite flat. So I, I sort of put my trust in, into the Whoop device and, and used it to, to guide my training. And I was really um, thrilled with the results that I saw uh, both in the day-to-day -day and sort of the overall uh, sort of training trend I had uh, and then my, my race down in Cozumel. So um, I know AJ is going to talk a bit about strain and re recovery scores, sort of what they mean. Uh, how they're measured and how we can use this data uh, to guide training, get the most out of you and maximize your race day performance. Um, we at BPC have used a number of different systems to try to quantify recovery. We've used profile of mood states, we've used rest wise and really, um, Everything up until this point has just been cumbersome or, or just hasn't had the science behind it. So we're thrilled to have a, a partner in Whoop that's taken a scientific approach to this and understands that stress is only one side of the equation and that we must balance that with recovery uh, to adapt and perform at our best. Uh, so that said, I'm going to turn things over to, to AJ, who, who's going to take over from here. Sure. Thanks, Jeffrey, for the introduction there. It's, uh, it's awesome to have you guys. I'm glad we're getting to do this and seeing a few people in attendance. It's, uh, I just want to make sure, can everybody hear me? I can. Okay, so I'm hoping I'm hoping that a few can. All right, cool. Sweet. Thank you, man, for uh, jumping in. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know if I have uh, control of the slide map. I do it. My, my title is I'm a performance development specialist. What I do is uh, I essentially help help teams and uh, athletes alike get the best out of their bodies by using the WHOOP system and then um, further developing them and helping them interpret the data as well. <clears throat> and what I've been doing with, with, with Jeff for the past couple months here is we've been kind of, a couple weeks, sorry, we've been going back and forth and, and uh, doing kind of a an overall, I guess, learning experience for the two of us in terms of seeing where the, where the value in WHOOP is lies for different people. And then um, I'm probably going to have a bunch of you guys on board as well. So, hey, AJ. Hey. Yep. What's that? My apologies. I muted everyone. Just we were getting a little bit of of static and feedback, so I just went ahead and muted. So, if you have a question, just stick it in that chat box. Uh, that should be up on your GoToMeeting panel. Nice. So, um, can everybody see my screen here? Awesome. Okay, cool. So, just a little introduction and background on Whoop. Whoop was founded uh, no more than four years ago out of the Harvard uh, by two kids who were trying to figure out why they're playing better on some days than others. Um, <clears throat> so, being smart kids and and, and scientists themselves uh, took a deeper approach and really dove into the ideas that the secrets that kind of can help you unlock where your where your peak performance days are going to hit. Um, 
and one of the quotes I like to kind of bring up is our CTO, this guy, this guy named John Capitalupo, um, said to said one time, he said, it's crazy to me to think that I could predict the weather two months from now or 10, 10 days from now, but I have no idea how my body's going to perform tomorrow. So we've uh, worked on a performance based system designed for the most elite of athletes, but you know I think that translates to a number of different ways. Myself, I've never been uh, quite the most elite, but <laughs> I did spend a certain amount of time training and and today, I still see a lot of value just from, from wearing on a daily basis without training for anything specifically. So um, what you're seeing right there is just the, the – that's our user interface. It would be a daily strain score. That strap right there is the actual hardware. And then uh, the software side in the background there. So these are just some of our brief testimonials. Give you guys an introduction as to who is, who is using Whoop and kind of where it, where it lies for a number of them. Uh, Kyle Lowry on the left has been with us for – a little over 18 months now. He's a point guard in the NBA. Connor Yeager has been with us. He's been one of our first clients. He's been around for about two and a half years now. And then Mike is a personal trainer. He's been, uh, he's been a serious help to us in terms of as an advisor and um, as an advocate in the, in the NBA and other professional sports. So what you're seeing right here is just this, the overall hardware and how it, how it actually works. Uh, that the, the black battery pack on the top there slides right on top of the strap, and that's that's how you charge. The whole concept of, of all this on one of our taglines is to uh, is really to kind of and get a, I mean to encourage people that are especially among athletes that you do need you're not just an athlete twenty or the three hours you're training you're an athlete twenty four seven, and this this helped this was this idea of have, needing to have this device be consistently monitoring and providing feedback is what really drove us to get this this. Uh, modular charging system that we have in, in that battery pack and allowing athletes to, to maintain that <clears throat> constant level of um, engagement with the device and, and the analytics that it provides. So as I was just saying, this is a continuous system. It provides you know, constant feedback from, from the wrist. So we're measuring five different things uh, 100 times a second. And those five things are heart rate, heart rate variability, skin response, accelerometry and motion. We also built in an ambient temperature gauge that can pick up things like humidity, humidity altitude, because those affect your cardiovascular systems differently, and we want to help reflect that in the actual events that you're going through. So what you're seeing right here is a little flow from, we do work with teams on a team basis, and we also work with individuals. So uh, as you guys collect the data from your wrist, all that is taken from the hardware and then put on the software and broken down through our internet platforms. This is actually uh, this is something. This is a breakdown of what our team page would look like, and I know a lot of you at BPC are going to be joining that team page. Uh, it just helps you know athletes and trainers alike <clears throat> really kind of measure themselves against others, and then specifically for the coaches, it's a really really helpful way for them to action the data that you guys are bringing out. Yeah. So uh, when we say analyze pregame recovery, this this actually, this slide came from our uh, most recent meeting with uh, our most recent presentation with the MLB um, in which we, we had a, the largest performance study ever recorded and that was 230 athletes throughout the MLB um, and pregame recovery meaning on game days we use that we use that recovery metric to help dictate starting lineups batting orders pitching um, and it actually rendered some really awesome results that I can I can talk about later this right here being our key metric throughout the entire thing heart rate variability is that naturally it's, as you can see they're naturally occurring irregularity of your heartbeat. What it really is, is it's, a, it's a tiny amount of time between variations of beats of your heart. So if you're looking at this right now, your heart can be, you know, 0.25 seconds between beats one time, and then between the next two beats, it can be a full second. What that is, is a tiny amount of time, is really, it's competition driven by both your parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. So while one tries to bring it up, the other tries to bring it down, the competition between the two really shows that. Um, <clears throat> really allows your heart to adapt to different situations that it's thrown into and uh, help it adjust to any situation. So here's a little bit of a deeper breakdown. Uh, <clears throat> if you want to look at it on the left side there, I think that's probably the best description of HR. Muted. The concept is uh, what are the three what are some of the things that we really want to be able to help out predict? So one of them was we need to be able to say figure out in the morning, but like right when you wake up in the morning, we need to be able to tell where your body stands in terms of athletic and mental performance. Muted. How 
own most recent study, uh, not most recent, but one. We did this last year with a a group of Division One athletes and Olympians, and uh, this is 120 people. Your statistics seen on the right side here. What that was, is the guys who wore boots, 120 of them over a four-month period, experienced dedication to more than 41 minutes of sleep. Unmuted. That's among the entire group, of average. Hey, AJ. Um, con consumption of alcohol. What's that? AJ, can, can I? Um, you are just super scratchy. People are having a really hard time um, hearing you. Uh, is it possible? Are you using your computer audio, or are you dialed into this? Computer audio. Should I dial in? Uh, why don't you try dial in? We'll see if that's any better. Um, I'll give you a phone number to do so. It's going to be. Ready. Yep. It's uh, one eight seven two. Yep. Three eight one eight seven two. Okay. Then, uh, see if this is any better. You should have, um, it should give you, uh, it should ask for an access code. Yeah, I just don't know your audio pin, so you'll have to, under uh, that audio tab, under phone call, if you click that, um, it will give you your audio pin. Do you see where I'm talking? Yeah, I just need to get the, uh, the audio pin here. Hold on one second. It should be eight seven one three four one zero zero five. You entered no digits. We aren't receiving your number entry due to a possible issue with your Is this where I do karaoke for a little while? Hey, so does this sound better? That, it sounds so much better right now, yeah. Okay, cool. Let me pull this back up. Awesome. So, uh, how much do we miss? Uh, Probably a lot, I'm assuming. All right. So, I'll just start right here. So, this is uh, this study we're seeing on the side here. This is actually something we did with a group of college athletes and professional athletes as well as Olympians. We had 120 guys wearing WHOOP for a four-month period, and these are the results we experienced on the right side here. So, we had 40 minutes across the whole group dedicated on average more to sleep per night. Alcohol consumption reduced by 79%, <clears throat> which was um, the way we took that was through surveys as well as people seeing it reflected in both their resting heart rate and heart rate variability data over the period of time. Um, heart rate variability being increased by 8 milliseconds on average, that's a pretty strong feat because it is very hard to do, especially among athletes who have experienced training, training lows and highs already during the season. And then the reducing, the reducing resting heart rate by 3.8 beats per minute is pretty 
pretty difficult to do, and I, I think resting heart rate is a pretty good um, indicator of, of overall physical conditioning. Which so that's a that's a strong correlation for us in results as well. Um, and then the 60% reported less injuries. I think a lot of that has to do with things like um, straining a hamstring or the word tweak that is directly correlated to neuromuscular fatigue, heart rate variability, and overall sleep performance. So something that we take a lot of pride in is sleep and recovery analysis. And that 60% less reporting is meaning we're avoiding those small injuries. We're avoiding those things like hamstring tweaks or, um, you know, slight muscle sprains, those things that keep you out for about four to five days at most, those small injuries that are frustrating, that's what we're really trying to solve, and I think we did that really well with this study. So to take a deeper look into the scientific approach that is WHOOP, um, <clears throat> as you're seeing right here, this is a pretty awesome picture of a pretty tough-looking guy. None of, none, none of us in our office really look like that, I'll be sure. I'll be the first one to tell you. Um, but, so we'll jump right in. These are our three metrics. I think there's really about three pillars to our overall system. The first one is strain. So strain is a, uh, is a cumulative measure throughout an entire day that, as you can see, is broken down into a different, different sections here on a 21-point scale. The reason we choose 21 is through all the research that we've done, if you were to ask, if you were to ask um, a group of athletes to go through a workout and then have them come back and say, on a scale of 1 to 21, what was your workout? And if somebody says 15, chances are that they spent the average time in that workout in that, fifth, in that 150 beats per minute range, which is actually kind of funny, but we did it with 150 people and we reported back positively with 122, which I thought was kind of interesting. So that's not the entire basis, but that's just a, one correlation we've made to it. So as you can see, zero to seven, that's not too hard to get to. You'll probably wake up in the morning with something around a three or a four, just because having heart rate data and being alive is somewhat you know, valuable in terms of uh, taking, taking data and, <clears throat> and measuring your overall strain on your body throughout a day. That 8 to 11 range is something like if you were to go play golf, play 18 holes and walk the course, you'd probably be somewhere around 8 to 11 because um, your heart rate would probably average somewhere around you know, 90 to 100 beats per minute. That hard and very hard range, that's a lot more difficult to get to as, as, as a scale of 12. So that score 12 is a lot di more difficult to get to than a lot of people think, which is you know something we experience around our office very often, which is people thinking they're spending you know their entire day working out and then realize it's just you know never really broke those heart rate thresholds. Um, and then that near maximal area, the, the the scale we built this whole thing on was that we needed to be able to incorporate a max a max cardiovascular exertion like something like running an Ironman. So. When we get down to uh, Jeffrey's data from his Ironman later, you'll see where he got to, and that's that's about as much as you can possibly put on your body for an entire day. And then a deeper look at this. So as you want to look into a day strain score, day strain is really valuable because one thing we uh, wanted to do, going back to the 24-7, always on kind of mentality, was be able to measure the behaviors you have outside of training and really help you figure out how to action those. So for me personally, if I look at my day, you know, I have my commute to work in the morning, my full work day, and then commute home, and then the, my, my workout itself. And if I look at the, the heart rate throughout the entire day, it's building up early in the morning as I walk or ride my bike to work. And then throughout the day, if I'm sitting at a desk, it'll stay low. If I'm running around, it'll be a little higher throughout the day. But the thing that's really interesting to me is that you can really see kind of where those peaks and those valleys are throughout a day just by looking at a raw heart rate throughout a whole day. And then this day strain score is really trying to help calculate those things and bring those actions that you're taking on throughout the day that might be stressful without even noticing them into your whole picture of what the day looks like and what the strain on your body actually looks like. The sleep performance along with recovery analysis I think are really the bread and butter of our whole system. I think what we do best is sleep. Um, the reason I say that is we spent a lot of time working with a company called NeuroCare who's down the street from us there in Boston, and uh, we've conducted over 150 sleep studies with them. You know, calibrating to what we're calibrating to what we do using polysomnography to <clears throat> break down both the time that you fall asleep, the time that you wake up, and then also look dive into things like sleep cycles. So. I think the big value is that people don't actually understand what they do during their sleep and how much sleep they lose to things like disturbances or how long it takes them to fall asleep. So 
for me personally, it's like I was going to bed at 12 p.m. and getting up at you know 6 a.m. and thinking that was six hours of sleep. That's definitely not the case. If I were to be honest with myself, you know, I'd probably roll over three or four times throughout the night and experience, you know, something else during the night, and and then, uh, you know, it takes me about 15 or 20 to fall asleep. So it turns out I was actually only sleeping about four hours and 45 minutes throughout the night when I think I was spending actually six hours of sleep. So here's how we're actually calculating. And uh, we're looking at the total time in bed you spend. So the second you lie down and your heart rate hits that certain threshold, along with the amount of motion that you're going in, that's how we really calibrate when you get in bed. And then the hours of sleep is the total number of sleep. So the, the hours and the minutes that you got actually asleep versus just, not, just the time spent in bed. Uh, the disturbance is, you know, somebody can lose up to you know, almost two hours of sleep at night if they're a very active sleeper, which is, you know, more common than people think. Uh, and then latency, so latency is the amount of time it actually takes you to fall asleep. And if it takes you less than 10 minutes, chances are you're starting to, you know, experience a little bit of sleep debt. You want it to be right around 12 or 15. That's the perfect amount of time. Uh, and what I mean by that is the second you lie down in bed and say, okay, I'm going to sleep. And if it takes you immediately, you're probably underdoing it in terms of total sleep. Unless you're just an incredible sleeper and you, you have it whenever. And then the sleep cycle stuff is also really interesting because that's where we measure heart rate variability and resting heart rate. So REM, which is your most mentally regenerative state, that's that's the kind of thing that, you know you want to experience that if you have a big meeting up in the morning or something like that. Or there's also a myth around REM sleep before two nights before a race is also the best way to you know make sure your body's ready. That's actually not true. There are also correlations to suggest that slow wave sleep before a race, the night before, is the best possible thing to do. Reason being, that's your most physically regenerative state. Uh, and in slow wave sleep, in the last five minutes, we're measuring both resting heart rate and heart rate variability. The reason we're doing it there is because a lot of the times, other things, they try to measure heart rate variability and resting heart rate, for that matter, while you're awake. And there are respiratory factors, psychological factors, that can be taken in and to those readings and really throw them off. So we think we're getting a very true reading of both heart rate variability and resting heart rate because one, we're measuring it from the wrist using a light sensor, an LED sensor. So there's no other light in the room unless you're sleeping with the lights on. Um, your body's not moving around. Your mind is shut down. It's the perfect time to measure something like that, like heart rate variability and resting heart rate. So. That's when we take those measurements and then we process that along with the accumulated sleep that you have, the amount of strain that's got onto your body, and your total sleep performance the night before into recovery. So recovery is really, I think, the most valuable thing we have. It's both a, it's both a stress response and an, and an actionable insight. When I say stress response, I mean two people could go through the exact same workout in the same day for the same amount of time and then go to bed at the exact same time and wake up at the exact same time and have totally different responses to the day that they had before. Part of that is one, how they sleep, and then two, how hard that workout was for them specifically. And that's what I mean by stress response. What I mean by actionable insight is if you were to see that 97, you know that your body's in prime position to have an absolutely fantastic workout or put out your best possible performance. When you look at the 65, it's probably going to you're probably going to wake up feeling the same exact way you did when you hit the 97, but once you start moving around, you might be a half step slower than usual. Or the, you know, if you're playing a basketball game or something like that, the game's going to be coming at you a little bit faster than usual, and it's just going to feel a little bit less like you're at your best. And then that 32%, that's telling you that your body is in a tough spot. It is in, it is a little bit beat up. Chances are you didn't get enough sleep, um, or your heart rate variability is really down, which is a, which is something you got to think about and say, all right, this is time for me to pull back on the reins a little bit. I should probably have an easier day. Maybe instead of doing a heavy weight lift or a long run, I should do a little bit more metabolic work, maybe something along the lines of aerobics as well. Um, or if I'm going to run three miles, instead of running it at an 8.15 pace, I'll go ahead and run it at a nine-minute pace. That's the kind of thing we're trying to give, so that way the next day you can come back with that proper and, not, and that really strong high recovery. So... <clears throat> These are the three metrics that really we focus on the most in terms of measuring recovery, and that's heart rate variability, resting heart rate, and then the sleep performance you got the night before. And when you see recent trends right there, what that means is that's talking about the sleep debt you haven't been getting 
and the strain that's gone on your body as well. And then to get that higher recovery score, the hope is that your HRV is trending upward. So if you do have a low HRV right now, or when you start, that's not necessarily a bad thing because if we can help you get it upward, that's, that's the real goal for us. And HRV is also an incredibly personalized and individual stat. So some people's HRV is just going to be lower than others, and there's nothing you can really do about that. Part of that is probably, you know, coming back from <clears throat> or at least being affected by a history of athletic training. Uh, it's also affected by age, gender, height, weight, all of that goes into it. So it's a really, it's a really individualized stat. And then this is also kind of what I think is the most interesting thing for us. This is the stress response equation that we're talking about. So remember how we talked about the casual light, uh, zero to seven kind of scale? That's the kind of area you want to stay in when your recovery is low. So if you look at this, like two ladders stacked together, and you see the, the red section on the right with the recovery, the yellow with the, the right there as well, and then the green at the top, if you keep yourself kind of parallel or uh, perpendicular. So if you draw a line, and perpendicular across these two at 7, at 14, and then at 19, That's those are the kind of regions you want to stay in based on recovery. So if you have a low recovery, let's say it's 30, you want to probably stay under 8 for your strain. If you have a mid-recovery, like a, you know, say, say 60, probably you probably want to be up somewhere near 13. And then if you have that top workout, that top recovery, that's when you want to go ahead and push if you want to get to that very hard spot, that high strain. And this is uh, this is so this is the full Ironman Kazumul day. This is uh, Jeffrey's data from that day, as you can see. Good solid sleep right there. Ninety-two percent of his total max. Good morning. Looks like we had a nice, you know, getting prepped. And then here's the big time spike into the full swim. You can see right when they dive in, and then right about there, it's consistently somewhere up in about the seventy-five percent, eighty-five percent range, and about one hundred and fifty beats to one hundred and seventy-five there at the end can imagine this spot right here was very difficult. And then this is really impressive to me is this incredible amount of drop right there. That's a that's a sign of incredible physical fitness. Um, but then it's good to see a nice relaxing day in the back there. Um, so this is this is what makes the whole system so interesting is that you can see this data on a on a total scale. And if you were to look at like my data from that Sunday, it probably stayed, you know, somewhere like this across that entire bottom. I never broke the 75 spot. So it's really interesting to see somebody else and then see a full competition go out through the entire day like that because this is what our system is built around. This is the maximal amount that your body can take on on a day-to-day -day basis is something like an Ironman. This is what we wanted to see, and that's a, this is a really good representation of the kind of workout an Ironman actually is. And then this is the whole training period going up to it. So starting back at Friday, the, uh, the 28th of October, it's really kind of – as you can see, you see an optimal kind of spot right there at the beginning. And then as we kind of go forward, that strain stays, you know, going up and down. We see some high recoveries in there. We see some perfect matches in terms of strain matching with recovery as well. And then you see this period where we have that dip in recovery score. So right around November 7th, you see that big drop off and then another one and then a tough little valley right there. That's a period of overtraining, clearly. And, you know... <clears throat> If we're going to think about this on a long scale, that period is probably going to affect you about three weeks later, which is the interesting part. Um, so then we see another peak in HRV here. And then as you can see, here's the tapering period, and we start to get back to, you know, these recoveries are becoming more and more aligned with each other. Almost, You want to see a kind of straight line across here. That's the, that's the ideal taper. Actually, what you really want to see is a straight line going upward like that. But And we can kind of see that going into Sunday because you see here we have – about five or six back-to-back -back yellows, and then we had to trend upward to a high yellow, probably about a you know 63 or 65, and then we have in that green zone, and this is this section right here. This is what I call parasympathetic saturation. So what that means is that his heart rate, resting heart rate, sorry, went down a little bit and trended a little bit downward, and then the HRV also trended a little bit downward after trending up. So that says to me that that's a perfect spot to go and get into competition. And in Jeffrey's case, he, this is the third Ironman of the year, which is an incredible amount of training load. So you know, that's a pretty good thing to see going into a race like that. 
So um, I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. That was kind of a quick run through of what Whoop is and the total system. And if there's any uh, any questions at all, I'd love to answer them. So I think we're going to probably do it through that chat. Um, I haven't been able to follow along, but uh, I haven't seen anything like that. So if there's there's uh, questions or anything like that, feel free to shoot them through that chat. And um, yeah, love to love to take some. So the total amount of users as of right now, um, that's going to be spread between the majority of our collegiate and professional teams because we're just starting to release to prosumers now. Um, that first group, I'd say, of prosumers is about a thousand people. So in the next two months, we'll be adding a thousand people to our list from uh, the 500 we have right now. Uh, okay, let me see the next one. So, Cindy, I'm looking at your question. Is this the best to lead up to a race during off season two? So, I think this is, you know, probably best suited as an off season tool for so many people who are trying to make their bodies better to head into whatever race they have or whatever season they have coming up. It is a huge advantage to know where you are on a day to day basis and, and during a regular season to make sure you're recovering properly. I mean, for me, I personally played football for four years and uh, in college and. I definitely was draining myself on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and then getting to Saturday and probably being a step slower than I wanted to be. So I think as an off-season training tool, it's an incredibly valuable thing as you're trying to build muscle or lower that lower that resting heart rate and get yourself into proper or peak physical condition. Okay. Is this the, uh, and I think this is the page you're talking about? I'll pull this up for you. So to break this down a little bit, again, what we're seeing, this is, if we were to look at this from top down, so 21 and 100, that strain matches up with that recovery is what I'm trying to say. So when you're in that yellow zone, you want to stay somewhere, you know, if you're going to optimally train, that's probably what I should have said first, is that to, uh, to train at the absolute best way is to match your recovery each morning with that same level of strain on this, on this scale right here. So, for example, my recovery this morning was 71. So, you know, at best, if I want to train, I should go up to about a 15. And if I wanted to under-train, I'd be somewhere down in 10. And if I was over-training, I'd probably be somewhere near 18. So if we go back to Jeffrey's data here, <clears throat> as we can see with him, so what's going on is that he's got he's got this optimal training stages. Like if we were to look at this first day right here, this is perfect. This little up and down arch right there, that's perfect. As is this section over here. We have you know this is a little this is a little bit over training, but that's not too bad. Another perfect spot right here. Um, and I think there's another one this year. Yeah, this trend as well, that's also really good to see. That's the kind of thing that you, over a period of time, the value in the collection of this and being able to kind of see these things and say, okay, so my recovery level is, let's say, 65. I shouldn't push too, too hard today, but I should push myself just to get to that right spot. For the most elite athletes, that's exactly the kind of information they have never had, and that's why we've had success in places like the MLB and the NBA. Um, do we train to sync to link to training peaks? Um, we're in the process of that. I actually was just recently informed that they have HRV applications now. So the thing that we've been doing for our elite teams and coaches is that we've had uh, our own operating system just to, you know, as many people want to make this more simple and more broken down so that everything's kind of connected and harvested in one spot. We did that with our data because we were yet to really figure out where it applied the most. 
So in the near future, we will have uh, an application to Training Peaks, uh, but it's just not not there yet. It's on our radar, but it's not quite there yet. Yes, I can't explain HRV. And a high HRV is a really good thing for a couple reasons. One, it shows that there's a lot of variation and a lot of competition between both your your parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system. Why that's good is because it means both of them are very healthy and both of them are working hard. So it essentially is saying that when you get up and you go work out in the morning and you have a high HRV, your heart is going to be able to adjust to any situation it's thrown into. It's going to say, all right, so you have a tough workout, high intensity right off the bat. You're going to be able to get up to that 200 beats per minute mark or that, that 80th percentile, wherever your max is, and then it's also going to be able to come back down to that resting heart rate quickly. Think of it as the period of time where you have to kind of bend over and put your hands on your knees. When you get to that spot, and then you have to kind of you know catch your breath, and then, then you can start going again, it'll take longer to get to that spot with a high HRV and you'll be able to get out of that spot quickly. And then other things that HRV actually plays a role in are cognitive and mental reaction and awareness. So what that means for me, particularly in, if I had a, you know, an important meeting to be giving a presentation at in the morning, and I woke up and I had that high recovery, I would show up and I'd be thinking more quickly, I'd be on my feet a little bit better, somebody throws a tough question at me, I'd have a better answer for it you know, right off the bat. It's those small little things that you really can notice. A great example is actually, so I'm about six foot one. Uh, in college, I could dunk a basketball with pretty, pretty good ease, but uh, you know the athletic prime has passed me a little bit, and so now I'm uh, right on par with, you know, sometimes I can get it, sometimes I can't. And what really sold me about Whoop, I mean, because when I started working, I started wearing it and wanted to learn it for myself and see how it really worked. And every time I had that high recovery score and I went to go play basketball, I'd always try to dunk. And for whatever reason, I am finding that when my HRV is up, I'm having the ability to dunk back in my repertoire. And if my HRV is really low, I might miss, the, miss come up like six or seven inches short, which is a lot in that sense. So... It's really interesting to see those small things. I know one of my colleagues, he would bike to work, and the first thing he had to do every morning is go over this big hill. And he says, when I had high HRV, I'd get over the hill no problem. When I was low, it was a battle just to get up the thing. How can you ma manipulate HRV long term? Um, the big thing is, is, is not overtraining. So undertraining will saturate your HRV, and it will also bring it down. But if you find ways to stay consistently active in the right zones and not push yourself too far for too long, that's the kind of real way to make your heart rate trend or HRV to trend upwards. Finding out, and then also sleep plays a huge role in all things related to your heart. So if you can add a little bit, add like 45 minutes more sleep or pick up a 20 minute nap each day, those kind of things really do make a huge difference in HRV numbers in the long run. Uh, the charging technique is is really simple. So when you get the device, you have a battery pack and you have the strap itself. That battery pack plugs into a USB cable and charges up. In about 40 minutes, that will charge. And then in about 44, or 45 minutes more, put with the battery pack on your actual strap, your, your battery life will go back from 0 to 36 hours and then you can take it off and leave it wherever you want. So the modular charger is just a battery pack that slides right on top of the device while it's on your wrist. So HRV numbers are, as I said earlier, they're very, they're highly individual. So for me personally, like my, my HRV range is somewhere from 60 to 120. And, and obviously the 120 is a pretty good number, but you know, it's not indicative as to what I actually have for an HRV. So I'd say a good HRV is anything between, I mean, also, this is also dependent on age, gender, height, weight, athletic background, training history. All of that stuff is taken into account in this. So that's, a, that's why it's really hard to answer these. Um, but I would say that a good HRV is anywhere from 70 and up, and a bad one is, you know, somewhere between 20 and down. 20 and down, because if, you're, if your heart rate variability is in, in, you know, under 20 or in the single digits, 
it's like the single digits I've actually never seen, but I've seen in the 18s or 19s. And uh, yeah, that's just me. That's either a chronic state of, of being overtrained or uh, you might have been out drinking the night before, that kind of thing. So all the information that I'm pulling right now, these are the, so with, with this, particularly with Jeffrey's data, this is directly from our web mobile web, this is from our web application. What that means is you go to app.loop.com, you sign into your own username, and then bang, this is the first thing that shows up. Just this, this page that has your, your strain, your sleep, your recovery, all of it is broken down for you. Um, and then you also have a mobile web application. All of the data from your wrist is streamed directly through Bluetooth to your phone. So all you have to do is open up the app, and you'll have your scores right there. And then if you can see your full heart rate data there as well. And we also have a sleep coach that can tell you kind of exactly what kind of um, sleep numbers you need and your, what your baseline sleep need is on a day-to-day -day basis. How would you determine what's good for you? Um, so over the course of the first three days that you wear Whoop, we're calibrating. So we make general assumptions, as the system does at least, on who you are and where you should be based on height, age, weight, all of those factors. And then over those first three days, we see kind of what those first three days of heart rate variability, resting heart rate, sleep performance, what those are going to render. And then through the next four days, we constantly compare back and forth between those first three. And then after the first seven days, we officially kind of made measurements on who you are and where you should stand. And then as we go forward, it's constantly learning to you. So the more you use it, the more personalized it will get. So for me right now, a good HRV for me is anything over 70. Um, and a bad one is somewhere, you know, under 55. All, yeah, so we have no screen on the strap. All of it is viewed to the mobile web application. The, the strap itself is primarily made and designed strictly to, for data collection purposes. We wanted to make this as discreet and um, as capable as we possibly could. So it is totally waterproof. Um, you shower with it. You can swim with it. It can, it can be you know, hit with a lacrosse stick. It's, um, the whole goal is that we didn't want it to be something you had to think about while, while you were wearing. We wanted it to be almost invisible and un, unfeeling while you were using it. And, and to go back to your question, um, HRV is incredibly tough to gauge as good and bad. I know for me, it's anywhere between 70 and up. I consider it to be a good day for me. Um, but that's, you know, over the period of eight months wearing this thing and really kind of learning what I think is good and bad. So it does take some time to learn, but uh, Whoop system has enough capability to figure out on a day-to-day -day basis where it stands, and then you ba balance off of two-week averages at least. Um, so for you personally, I think after about 15 to 15, 20 days, you'll have a pretty good sense of what a good HRV is for you. So we do have a number of different strap options. Uh, as a triathlete, I might recommend the Hydro Band. It's more stiff. It dries quickly. It's really lightweight, um, and you kind of can barely notice that it's kind of on you. And it also looks pretty good. Is another another thing to add in there. Um, the ones that I would avoid for swimmers, the Nano Stretch, is more of a lifestyle band. It's more of something if you want to. If you're going to be playing pickup sports or rec league basketball and wearing it on a day-to-day -day basis, and you want it to just be the most comfortable, that's the Nano Stretch one. Uh, the Churchill and the Truman are also more tailored to, um, let's say, specific sports. The Truman itself is probably more of a, of a lifestyle band, and then the, the Churchill one, which has the the red, white, and blue stripes. I've seen people in soccer use that one. I've seen people playing basketball use that one as well. That one feels more like a watch band, but at the same time, it does dry nicely. It just you do have to take care of it if you're going to be sweating in it. When I say take care, I mean clean it. Uh, 
Um, I can kind of piggyback off this question here. And so part of my job is what Jeff would be doing. Um, <clears throat> what I do with a number of my college teams and professional teams for that matter is we take a look at this data. So I can show you on a day-to-day -day basis. If I'll look at, you know, go back to one of these slides here on strain. And so if I were to see, or I'll go to the team page. That's actually probably the best idea. So right here, I'll show you more closer up. Here we go. So on the side here, you see it have, you have the team list over there, and it has the green circle around. I don't know if you can really see it that well. And then yellow circles around some of the athletes as well. What that tells you each morning is, says, all right, so here's where each guy stands in terms of recovery, strain, where their HRV is, where their resting heart rate is as well, and then also sleep performance is thrown in there. So what you would do as a coach is you would look at that data and say, all right, what's a, what can I prescribe to make the best out of this morning's data? What can I look at and say, how can I action this recovery score? How can I make the best possible strain to match up with that recovery? And then how can we get back to full steam tomorrow? So what it is is, is providing enough data to then on the back end apply them and adjust training schedules. Yep, so in the user interface, we can just go right back to this slide. So on the, uh, you can barely see it, I'll find another one. Yeah, so right here, this is what we call the voice of whoop. And every single score you get, uh, whether it's recovery, sleep, strain, you will get something here that says, so for the example, this one says substantial strain. Um, and then gives you a suggestion as to something something small like, Make sure, you, or if you want a higher HRV, chances are you need to get more sleep or high, get a higher sleep performance. So small things like that, we have been building it out so that it's, you know, more, I guess, in depth in those recommendations. So uh, when you get the new app, this is actually a screenshot from Nova One, but when the new app is released, which should be um, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, there will be, there will be a, a, alters and um, adjustments made to those voice of loop comments. And you'll also be able to kind of tell as you go along. You'll see these things and say, okay, so that made a huge impact on what my recovery score was like. Or, wow, my strain was through the roof because I did that run uphill instead of on a track. There are small things that you'll do that this will pick up and you'll be able to say, okay, that made a huge impact. Like, for example, drinking alcohol really, really lowers both sleep performance, HRV, and resting heart rate. It, so actually, I lied there really lowers sleep performance in HRV and really brings up your resting heart rate. So we actually spent the last two years putting together Gen 2 and I can't say that Gen 3 is in the works at all and I don't see it on the near forecast. What we are doing with Generation 2 straps is as we continue to build Internally, we're going to update all of them, both hardware, firmware, uh, remotely, and the software we do remotely as well. So we'll be able to, every update that we make, all the, all the users on Gen 2 will get an update as well. And those happen rather frequently, I'm not going to lie. And that update can be something like adding, you know, workout auto detection, which is, we've been, you know, testing on our, on a development app for the last couple weeks here where it's you go through a workout and a strain score above 10 is picked up and processed and uh, we've been using a number of different ways to kind of break that down into specific workouts so hopefully in, I'd say by January the end of January maybe we'll have full-on workout auto detection that can differentiate between athletics and activities What about uh, sleep auto detection? Sleep auto detection we actually released over the summer. And so what that is essentially if you wear your strap and you go to bed, 
it's going to pick up when you first get in bed and then exactly when you fall asleep. That was one of the first things we wanted to scientifically validate. So we spent a lot of time doing that. We had third-party researchers and users actually kind of test those algorithms that we built to make sure it was a real thing. So every disturbance throughout the night, um, and then also every time you wake up, we'll be able to pick those things up and factor them in as well. So sleep auto detection, I'd say, is about 97% accurate. Good. And then um, uh, one of the ways that, that I plan to use this and that I know our other coaches are planning to use it is exactly, um, as you say, to log in and, and check out everyone's scores kind of in the morning. You know, it's, it's not to say if someone's got a recovery score of 39 that they are not going to get that day's intervals. It's just it, we may push them off or there may be a time that we're seeing good trends in both their resting heart rate, heart rate variability that we do want to push them another day. So it's not like we're, we're going to switch this device on and sort of turn our brains off. We're, we're get, we plan to use this um, in conjunction with our sort of the art and science yeah. of coaching. Um, so I, I'm yeah, that's, that. that's, a, that's a really good way to put it. Because, um, I mean, personally, I'll never tell anybody they need to work out less. I've always been a, a fan of the idea that you got to outwork the guy you go against or, you know, if you want to beat a time, you got to work hard enough to beat that time. So I'll never prescribe anything less, but the way I think about it is training and recovery are, are you know, their comparison. They're side by side. They're right foot and left foot. And you can't keep walking forward if you're taking only steps with your right foot. So when you take a step with your right, you've got to take one with your left as well. And that's kind of the relationship between stress response, recovery, and then training. So Jeff's got the right idea here in terms of <clears throat> both, one, playing things per situation, and then also making sure to use this as a, uh, as a guide but not necessarily a prescription. How does it differentiate between sitting still and sleeping? So there's a few things that we can do that, a few, a few things that we look at to do that. Um, there are certain heart rate thresholds that when you get to are about the same level as where you'd be sleeping, right? Um, the other thing is through skin conductivity and skin response, we can kind of tell what you're doing. So between accelerometry, which is moving in motion and all that as well, along with typical trends as to what your heart rate is when you go to sleep, and then your skin is actually at its driest right before, we, right before you fall asleep. So when we have all three of those things kind of you know sinking in the same spot, that's where we look at it and say, okay, we think they're asleep. Let's test the 30-second period. Are they staying in that spot? Let's test one minute, and then after that, we call it a sleep, if that makes sense. So what it really is is a combination effort of accelerometry and motion tracking, breaking into a heart rate threshold. That's why we have the calibration period at the start. And then also the skin conductivity and measuring that, so helping us determine latency. Awesome. Thank you uh, for letting me know I got that one through, Ann. All right. Well, AJ, uh, this has been fantastic. Thank you for your for your time and insight here. Um, if anyone has any yeah, questions, yeah, uh, I'm talking about it. Uh, specifically for AJ after this, he is baker at whoop.com. Is that right? Yep. Um, get back to that. I have it at the end of the slide here. Uh, but yes, baker at whoop.com. I'll actually, I'll type it into that chat right now. Okay. And um, uh, is it okay if I send along these slides to everyone that's been on the presentation tonight? Yeah, absolutely. That's the, uh, that's the goal. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And um, we're, you this is recorded, Thanks. so if uh, there's something yeah. you missed or if there's someone that you want to pass it along to, please feel free. Um, and, yeah, thank you again, AJ. Have a good night. Yeah. Thanks for having me, guys.